video has been very long in the making. I've replayed Kingsfield 4, spent an ungodly amount of time on a script, speaking for the amount of gross growth on my face. Speaking of which, ah, uh, there we go. Nothing oozes dark fantasy vibes better than Kingsfield. Sure, there are games with similar aesthetics such as Dungeon Keeper or other late 90s to mid 2000s games with 3D skeletons in them, but they're either too hard to find because they're all in niche sub communities or completely wiped off the face of the internet. It took me a long time to find this series after finally finishing Dark Souls 1, and even a year later to even get my hands on one of the best dungeon crawling experiences I've ever had. You may find it weird that I'm starting this retrospective at the tail end of the franchise lifespan. Well, Kingsfield 4 was my first entry to the series, and I feel like if you can appreciate this game, then you can understand the technical limitations throughout the whole series. I mean, this game barely controls better than Kingsfield 1, despite the PS2 having two, two analog sticks. Part of the experience is also the discomfort of the slow movement, making the player feel anxious and uneasy when exploring. Contrast this with Shower Tower. Shower. God damn it. Contrast this with Shower Tower. <laughs> Contrast this with Shadow Tower Abyss, where they clearly could have made the camera controls faster to create a different dynamic, but chose to stick with the Kingsfield trademark. Most of the technical inconveniences experienced in Kingsfield are attributed to creating the feeling of discomfort inside the player. You can tell that these gameplay choices were intentional. They would have been fixed at this point in the series. That being said, not every aspect of Kingsfield 4 is good, but it is good enough. Despite the slow camera movement, only rarely does it become a slog or a waste of your time. Even if you are a new player looking around every single corner for new things to discover, that experience in itself is worth it. And once you get used to the camera, you'll slowly adapt to it over time. Not only this, but every enemy in the game is designed with your camera movement in mind, giving them wide turning arcs so they can't backstab you out of nowhere and making combat a circle strafe dance of death. Another related aspect is the low FOV. Personally, stuff like this doesn't bother me if the default FOV is super low in a game especially when it comes to horror games. It aids a lot to the claustrophobia or generally increasing the horror, which is exactly how it works in Kingsfield. Couple this with its slow camera, dark and cramped areas, you can have some legitimately spooky moments within the ancient city, such as brushing up against death all the time, or the final area. Despite Kingsfield 4 not being a horror game, it thrives on your feelings of despair and desolation. Many of the areas have this oppressive air to them, be it in the environments or its enemies. It's not a harsh one note, rah, everything sucks the entire time. It's intermittent with relaxing, serene areas, some that fascinate you with its lore and logistics, and a couple of areas that cut out music entirely. Kingsfield 4 is the king of atmosphere and vibes. It nails the music, visuals, and everything I've already mentioned, blending them together beautifully to create an amazing dungeon crawling experience. All of which I'm going to be unpacking one step at a time. Just got to, uh, pop it in real quick. We start off the game with a glorious introduction to the Holy Land of the Forest Folk, where there used to be an ancient cursed idol of darkness that Grave misfortune will befall those who behold the idol that stares into the darkness. There's this massive army led by none other than the Swordmaster from Dark Souls 3. He can surely handle it. They're all dead, inexplicably, and now the idol of darkness that has obliterated countless kingdoms and generations is given to some random guy in a shack. 
I am sure placing the fate of a dying kingdom in our hands is a flawless plan that couldn't possibly go wrong. After that exposition, we get to see the trademark FromSoft fuckery that shows us that this game is not our friend. Not only is the trademark instant death here, but a crestfallen warrior sits near the beginning town to give us a weapon. This stretch in the early game is a little monotonous. You get to see your standard equipment, save spot, basic combat, what falling down a well with straight legs feels like, etc. Regardless of anything really happening yet, you already get a feeling of mass destruction and desolation throughout these lands. Through the gloomy sky of perpetual night and completely ruined architecture that crumbles before you. Eventually you stumble upon a healing church, a dainty little shack with a sick mother, and most importantly, the mines. The mines being your first dungeon. You can go into it searching for a rock of life. Three people have asked you for this rock of life, which can supposedly cure any illness and maybe do a lot of other MacGuffin type shit, but thankfully it's not a geck and has no bearing on the plot. The real challenge in the mine isn't just not getting poisoned by vaguely hitbox slimes, but also your own stupidity, bashing your head against an elevator which can go down, but not back up. Because you can't jump a two inch incline. Within these mines gives us the valuable pickaxe which teaches us that we can destroy barrels and other parts of the environment. The valuable encounter of a very exploitable miner striking it rich that we can steal from, teaching us to do evil goblin deeds. But also the rock of life from the dead husband of the sick wife. From this point on, you have the choice. Do you A. Sell the rock of life for massive profit to David Bunch for no real reason? B. Give it to the thief who will give you a crystal vial? Which is very important later on, but the player doesn't know it yet. Or... C. Give it to the sick wife so she doesn't die and you... feel bad or something. Maybe if I was some hack, I would go into why C is the best choice because it's morally right or something ridiculous. But C is not the best choice because of women, but because her daughter gives you the only item you need to progress. So if you give the Rock of Life to anyone else... Tough shit, buddy, you're gonna have to go down the path of poison and get yourself another one. No idea what happens when you sell both, because I haven't tried. David Bunch does not deserve your business, or respect. It shows yet again that Kingsfield is not your friend and sets up that you're going to be making lots of decisions that could either help, or severely harm your journey. Choices such as, hmm, should I sell my Idol of Darkness for 2G and forget about it until the very end of the game? So tread lightly. Don't forget to take out the grossest, most terrifying enemy in the game that drops the only item that makes magic viable, after sufficiently looting the poor family's home for treasure, that is. Delving into the chapel, we find the elusive and mischievous chest skeleton! Get fucked, dude. Before, we only got a glimpse of what the Idol of Darkness did to this land in its absence, and now we're making the arduous journey of walking straight into the center of it. We start to see some dying soldiers, corrupted as some sort of zombie controlled by little scuttle beetles. An old man who not only forgets to warn you about the skeleton graveyard beyond a door, but also refuses to warn you about poison water until after you've already drank it. Here's when we start to see the depressing aspects of Kingsfield. Some stories are told purely visually, through dusty old bones or a graveyard in an empty city. But for now, through dialogue or wall writing, such as the soldier who watched his friend turn into a monster, and just wants to die. This game will try to make you sad on purpose. We skipped over the encounter with a weak man who just wanted to get to his family. So we kill monsters for him, and when he get back, well, he's already dead. The player is also taught many game mechanics through visuals alone. We see items in the environment moving, so we can infer that we can shoot a dragon crystal off a pillar. We know that we can break crates and barrels since we see smashed ones earlier in the journey. This also teaches us that the environment is not stagnant, and we can interact and change it in a few ways. Even in the basement of the Palace of Oath, we can hear skeletons moving behind walls, so an attentive player can figure out about hidden walls early. Hidden walls being another mechanic implemented well, they're hidden but always in odd places. You won't have to end up hugging walls since you can trust your intuition to investigate oddly empty rooms or blank corners. The hidden walls really feel like a satisfying discovery because of this, and even more so when the rewards behind these walls are better than anything you can regularly pick up or buy in shops. For example, these Night Greaves that you can pick up in Guardian's Gate that last you for six whole hours in game. The point is, Kingsfield 4 does an excellent job at directing the player without blatantly pointing things out. This goes for exploration too. You never feel lost when you actually pay attention to the environment. Now, you may feel a little confused every now and then, but that's also the nature of the game. Another great example of this game's storytelling methods are at Guardian's Gate. 
and the newest area we're currently at. There's a guardian you find first with arrows shot into its face, simultaneously playing his visual storytelling, showing the player that these guardians are threats the expedition had to fight through, and as a mechanical explanation as to how you can take these down. It also feels natural to the environment. It's the first time we see these creatures and they don't feel out of place, having their own barracks in a sense. It's easily glossed over without any bright flashing lights and key jangling, but it's also not crucial information players can miss out on. We're starting to get our first semblance of lore forming, that of the Guardians meant to keep in something that ended up destroying the ancient city. We'll go more in depth on lore as the game progresses. For now, we find ourselves in the third layer of the ancient city, one of the few entrances from the surface. Looking up and down, we can see the architectural themes and overall layout of the city, though in disrepair. The ancient city was built by the king of the forest folk upon the ruins of an older civilization. The tower was a hub for craftsmen, engineer, and scholars, and any trades popularized by forest folk or earthen folk. Not much is known about the forest folk, other than they're all extinct, being killed in the collapse of the ancient city. The forest folk were the equivalent to elves, being highly intelligent magic users, some had the ability to imbue life to their creations, or invent complicated contraptions to aid society. Those within the underground walls who were more inclined to brute strength were the Earth Folk, the equivalent to dwarves. They aided the Forest Folk by crafting them weapons that were imbued with magical properties, and providing them meticulously crafted metals for their invention. The ancient city was split up into different districts for each class. We roam the ghostly halls of the top level that doesn't have many noteworthy distinctions, probably just residential areas for the forest folk, or a hub for trade with other cities. This opening bit of the ancient city is filled with great intrigue. I find it to be the moment the game starts to really pick up, showing off the depth of the dungeon crawling and interconnected map. It's not too intricate or difficult to mentally map out, but it's a steady climb up to the later dungeons, and a transition into not directly leading the player on a straight line, but providing multiple paths that will eventually lead to progress through key items or finding the right path. Most notably at the end of our first trek through the top level, we find a snake from Sense Fortress? We don't know much about these snake soldiers yet, but they're by far the most threatening thing we've faced. The snake were nearly faster than the player, deal heavy damage, and have the possibility of stunning you so we can infer what really destroyed the expedition, as we find an expedition key, presumably from one of the leaders, right around the two snakes. From this outer edge of the city, we can also peer down the cliff to glance at a lower area. On the surface, this may seem like nothing special, but it's more than simply set dressing. It's a full-blown area you actually explore many hours later, and from this point, we can really see the beauty of Kingsfield 4's map design. When you inevitably get to this point later in game, you can look up and see that exact cliff we're peering down right now, and this goes for other spots in the game too. It's nothing on the level of Dark Souls, where you can see nearly half the map at any given point, but the same attention to level geometry and interconnected design is still there, and it gives a satisfying cohesiveness to the ancient city and some of its connecting areas. Not only this, but over time you grasp a sense of where you actually are through all your mental mapping. So while you don't necessarily see where you are relative to the ancient city, you can definitely feel it at most points. And that realization when taking a new shortcut back to the city is one of the most satisfying feelings to me. It might be seen as a cheap example, but it really does feel closest to Dark Souls 1's map design, where everything is vertically connected to one hub. The ancient city functions in a similar way to Firelink Shrine, only it leads directly to more areas, rather than side areas linking together. That's not to say there aren't linking areas, but everything revolves around the ancient city a lot more, with areas acting as a connecting medium between two separate pieces of the city when not linking to an entirely different place. The opening moments of looking down and across the city doesn't fully do justice to the map what this one cliff edge does, but with both of them together you can start getting a scope of what things are really like, which is why the opener is so good, and it gets even better from here. I've talked about the Holy Forest before, but it is truly one of the most beautiful areas I've seen in a game. There's so much speculation in the land where you can wonder, where does this go, or what's that far off in the distance? Since it's so small and condensed, it feels like a crime that the Holy Forest is so small, but it's at very least a pleasant break from the oppressive underground. 
The Holy Forest is the original home of the Forest Folk, where the king resides in a place of great concentrated magic and light. It's said that the light of the forest was so powerful, an old king who wielded it was eventually locked away out of fear. The light was everything. It gave power to the Forest Folk and their creations. And this place is still a surprising shining beacon amidst despair. There is also a curious elf priest residing by a fountain in cathedral, seemingly the last of her kind destined to stay back and watching over the dying land, or help whoever comes by. The Holy Forest, although brief, is a very important hub that we'll be coming back to throughout our journey, to replenish our mana from the Healing Fountain. Without it, survivability would be incredibly tougher, as merchants run thin and healing supplies never last. The Holy Forest also leads to the King's Castle, another incredibly important area that we travel to very early on. If you were brave enough to venture through the Path of Pain, then you'd find your eyes instantly dyed purple and woefully outmatched by a Dark Souls 2 boss. Though I think it's cool you could technically clear this area way too early, even if you get nothing out of it. This little portion of the map houses some of the most important items in the entire game, either the black eye orbs in the forest or the waypoint wands within the castle treasury, guarded by these creepy all-knowing eyes. There's even more secrets we can't quite uncover until much later on that are paramount to our journey, but for now, we must delve back into the chaos of the ancient city. Yeah, somewhere, there's got to be some path we missed on the first floor. Pedestal stones, maybe? Guardian crowns? Oh, right, yeah. I remember on my first playthrough being stuck on the first level of the ancient city for a few hours, only to realize I needed to use a green warp rock. A green warp. A green warp rock. A warp rond. A green warp rond. Fuck. The green wand is a little out of place when you get it, since you already have other colored waypoint stones at the time, except green. Pretty sure the elf priestess even points out that you should investigate this wand, giving subtle hints to the player who hasn't quite figured it out. At this point, I still find this particular use for waypoint wands to be the best in the game. From here on out, you'd use them at specific rune spots to warp back to important areas. Set segments in the map where you put guidance stones in, but only here do you use them to travel into the unknown. There's always this sense of dread from not knowing what you're getting into, or if you'd even be able to get out of there. I wish there was another time the game utilized this, maybe for a hidden area. Extremely late game, there's an out of place violet wand that could have been used to the same effect. But regardless, we find ourselves in the heart of the residential area of the ancient city. Here we find the workshop of Arxgenian, a leading craftsman who most likely created the Guardians, and seems to have invented some sort of welcoming system, as his formless dialogue is all about a supposed invasion of the ancient city, something that happened a long, long time ago. Arx also mentions that the king has gone missing, something that contradicts a lore entry that should be unlocked at this point. The Ancient Battle The king of the forest folk forbade anyone to approach the Palace of Darkness deep beneath the new city. The prince entered and was banished. The prince's banishment lifted and he returned to the city. The door to the palace was opened again. During the confusion, the king was assassinated. So based off the dialogue and lore entries, the king may have not been assassinated after all, and instead gone missing during the time of an invasion of the ancient city. This also correlates with the king's room being locked to the player with seemingly no way in. This brings a few new mysteries to the table. Who was the prince? What was the invasion? both things we'll talk about later as the game unfolds. It's not what it'll bring up now, since the player already knows something went wrong with the ancient city, and we're only just picking up the pieces on what happened. As we will soon see, the darkness gnaws away, corrupts whatever it touches, even the strongest of lords. Leading across an eerie bridge, we find ourselves in the earthen folk area, only to find it just as desolate and abandoned as the forest folk quarters. It seems that all life was wiped from the city, save for the creatures of the dark. And these creepy ass scampering goblins, one of the more gruesome designs. This gives me a good chance to talk about the overall enemy design. Some of the previous enemies we faced were pretty menacing due to their size or creepy design. Standard enemies look like they fit inside the world well, despite the plants at the beginning being really dark for some reason. The skeletons are probably my favorite model in the whole game. For now, that's not saying much, but we're coming up on some really badass boss designs, and a few late game bosses have very menacing models. Overall, the enemy design in Kingsfield 4 feels threatening. You know what is and isn't an enemy, and can feel an accurate sense of what's going to give you trouble just from looking at the enemy's design and how it moves. 
Take for instance the sluggish zombie soldiers. They look rotted and aren't much of a threat. Their slow movements also give hints to the player that they hit like a truck with all their weight behind a swing. This goes for zombies in the mines as well. Skeletons are lanky, but just about as slow. They feel like a normal enemy, but can easily overwhelm you in numbers. The giant spider gives you an ah oh, fuck I don't want to fight this moment, and the player technically doesn't have to, but overcoming these imposing creatures is an important part of Kingsfield. Similarly, you know the snake soldiers don't fuck around with how much faster they attack from regular cannon fodder. Nearly double the speed and damage of a regular skeleton at this point, on top of being able to paralyze you. You can also tell they're threatening over how unique they look. Like many bosses in this game, the rarer and more exotic enemies are usually the most threatening. These lanky gremlins have similar feeling to the snakes, swift paralyzing attacks and a creepy glare. The first time you meet these creatures is within the king's castle, within a pitch black room. Not just that, but a massive room that could house anything. It's when you see the ominous red glow from their eyes. Enemy design is in the strong suit of the Kingsfield series, but it doesn't lack in some good designs. The game also does a good job at utilizing the right enemies for the environment, making them much scarier than they have any right to be at times, much like the Goblin Zone. Anyways, at the end of the village is a graveyard, where we find another fun and obscure mechanic, Grave robbing! Yes, that's right, this entire time you've been running past sacred sites of bones, you could have been shamelessly defiling them with malicious intent. Items are completely invisible on graves. Luckily enough, this usually isn't a big deal, cause all you find are arrows, herbs, or precious, precious bones. But in this case, if you didn't know beforehand, they could rob the dead, you'd be completely fucked and locked out of the forgery. But there's... something... off about this place. Everything is cold and frozen over. What happened here? Ice Forge is our first departure from the realm of the ancient city. We had the holy forest and castle, but those had a sense of familiarity and kinship with the design of the city. The frozen forge is much farther, made by the earthen folk and corrupted in some way. Because of this unfamiliarity, the area is inherently more unsettling, not even to mention the couple frozen earthen folk we find. It's our indirect task to find out what happened here before we move on. Thick ice packs across the walls, floor, and ceiling. Cold permeates through the air, and the ice is so dense that not even our fire magic can break it, teasing us future areas we might be able to access later. Only thing we can do is fight through ice golems and explore our way to the following area. And it has practically the same music as the last two. Yeah, I'm gonna be honest here. As much as I like the frozen refinery and subsequent lava area, going back through the refinery afterwards is probably the weakest section in the game. Though that's not saying much, because all the areas are pretty solid in themselves. The only problem with the forge is that it feels repetitive after exploring through it the first time. There's ice you can uncover the second time through, but you have to go back through the lava area a second time also. Granted, both of these areas are short, the same background music gets grating after about 30 minutes, or less, making the overall experience not very pleasant. The majority of background music in the ancient city is very good and atmospheric. Its sound font feels very fitting for the grimy dungeon crawling and bleak lore. There are some amazing tracks we've passed over so far, such as the Holy Forest. Getting into the soundtrack more later on, as the endgame has some breathtakingly beautiful moments. The sound design in Kingsfield is one of the strongest aspects. Music usually cuts out during important fights, adding much more tension to the battle, quite the opposite of Dark Souls. Certain environmental objects emulate sound effects that add a lot of realism to the world, and in other places add an extra ominous factor to dark corridors.
The music in Kingsfield is what originally got me into the series. And while the Earthen Folk area music is not bad, it's very stretched out, which makes it annoying after staying in the area for so long. The lava area shouldn't have had music at all. It's a tense, short run to first kill a lava gun that's blocking the stream, and later place an important icon of ice. It would have benefited a lot more from the added tension of no music, while simultaneously easing the player's ears from hearing bwah, 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 for 40 straight minutes. Anyways, I do like the lava area. I think the dinosaurs are cute, and the ogre fight isn't bad. Returning to the refinery though, we find it overflowing with lava. Here is the most interesting stretch of the area, where we wrap up the loose ends and find that dwarf that we unfroze is still miraculously alive. Here we have one of the most useful NPCs in the game, who will actually repair and upgrade your equipment for free, you just have to spend some time with him because he's lonely. This earthen folk is the last of his kind, and very depressed over the fall of his people, so he hammers away endlessly at his forge to ease his pain. Oh yeah, equipment degradation has been a thing this entire time. With the army you wear and the weapons you use, the only way to restore them is through this character, and without repairing your equipment, it slowly loses all of its stats with use. The degradation mechanic is nice, but not super imposing. Up until this point, you don't find yourself scraping by with just barely functional equipment, unless you were wearing the same pieces of armor throughout the entire game, you don't have to make that many trips to the dwarf. Upgrading is pretty weak in itself, only adding a few points of attack to a certain stat. Both mechanics take a real time that you have to wait to process, usually 5 minutes or so, which isn't too bad since you can process all of your equipment at once, but it makes upgrading really not worth it, it's not necessary to beat the game anyway. Moving back to the forge, we find that, hey! There's more than one earthen folk alive and- Oh, he's corrupt as hell. The old imposing king of the earthen folk. During the invasion of the ancient city, he was supposedly corrupted by the darkness and took the icon of ice from its pedestal in the lava caves, which may have served the dual purpose of overflowing the refinery of lava and killing a majority of the dwarves, while the king also probably used it to freeze the rest of his domain. It's unclear why the king would do this, which is why it's assumed he was corrupted by darkness, something the dark has a tendency to do to royal blood. After placing the Icon of Ice, we can pick up the Black Scar, an ancient sword imbued with living fire from a legendary hero, who we might hear of later. Not only this, but we can fight a fire demon at the heart of the Lava Caves, who may have been one of the leaders in the invasion of the ancient city, and definitely responsible for the downfall of the Earthen Folk area. Upon killing him, we get the sickest armor piece in the game, Living Flame Armor, to go along nicely with Black Scar. But there's nothing left to do here other than descend further into darkness. Now that the refinery isn't overflowed with lava, we can finally pop out the other side of the earthen folk area, crossing one of the many isolated bridges, and getting a glimpse at the vast dark cavern surrounding the city, being able to see many distant flames flickering from places we may or may not know. It is the first time we find ourselves wrapping all the way back around the ancient city after a long delve into an adjacent cavern and the familiar music hitting you along with a realization further cements the map design as brilliant and effective. I was really blown away by this my first time playing. We don't find ourselves on the second floor, but clearing the one last wing with a third that was completely inaccessible by any other means. This is generally how the player clears through the ancient city, and it's really satisfying discovering an inconspicuous path that you can link back to the center tower yourself through the bridges. This also gives the city a sense of being bigger than the player initially knows. At the very beginning, we're confined to a single bridge and only a few doorways, with the rest of the pathways being dilapidated and too broken to traverse, leading the player to believe that a majority of the ancient city and its pathways would be inaccessible, when in reality, only a few pathways are too broken from their original architecture to traverse. There are way more interconnected cavern systems than the player can see from the center tower. While this center tower would have been the convenient way of traversing between floors back when the city was populated, there is still a main path that wraps around the outer perimeter of the walls, which is what we use to access level 2. All of these interconnected pathways not only make the map satisfying to explore, but also immersive as the whole city feels realistically designed with convenience in mind despite its vertical nature. But back on track with level 2, we find ourselves in the engineer's quarters with the most absurd mechanic in the game, a hidden floor trap door. One of the few hidden walls I'll actually point out in this video, mostly because it comes completely out of nowhere. I think that this is the only hidden floor in the game, but a house is the power bracelet, which would be good for magicless classes. Don't know why you'd ever want that, because magic is busted in this game. And regardless, is a unique item that's very well hidden. 
While most of Kingsfield's important powerful equipment is on the beaten path, any extra unique items are either really vague or near impossible to find, such as, spoilers, the wave crasher in the ocean shore that's completely invisible to the player, and can only be found through a sound cue that only plays when you have a broken katana equipped. Needless to say, I never found either of these during my playthroughs. I didn't even know they existed. Much like the Triple Fang, which I won't spoil its location, but it's one of, if not the only reference to the earlier Kingsfield titles, minus the Moonlight Sword, of course. Being a prominent sword in at least one of the games, which directly links Kingsfield 4 into the universe of the previous three games, despite their lore being entirely separate. So stay tuned for the next three years while I figure this one out in the Ultimate Kingsfield lore video. Past the hidden floor, we have the cutest giant isopod who is definitely friendly and we don't need to. We then need to cross a bridge pummeled by shooting McFire boys, leading us to a hub of multiple points of interest. A room full of Dark Souls 2 masks that get angry when you slap the wrong one, a nexus that connects to many future areas while looping back to the central tower, and a boss fight with a dark sorcerer. Upon entering his lair, he whispers, They still exist, the remnant of the forest folk. The fight itself is pretty unique. He manipulates the terrain and traps to his advantage, making it more tense and difficult. But the lore implications here are far more important. It turns out that this entire time we've been playing as Prince Deviant of Azalin, a member of the royal family in an adjacent kingdom to Heladin, the land that the Idol of Sorrow brought destruction to. Since the Heladin expedition resulted in failure, a mysterious cloaked figure transported the Idol through the depths of the ancient city, all the way to Deviant since he was a long descendant of the Forest Folk. This also explains why he can use magic. Even without the Clarity Bracelet, his magic stat is very low, but still existent. In the lore of Kingsfield 4, this was only a power granted of the Forest Folk, so his heavily diluted Forest Folk lineage still resides within him. But who delivered the idol to Deviant? Who brought the idol to Heladin? Who is the Dark Sorcerer? It's not very explained who specifically brought the idol to Heladin, or how they got the idol into their hands. But for now, this sorcerer is presumably one of the four servants of the Dark One, a mysterious entity that may have control over the Idol of Sorrow, or can draw power from it. The purpose of these servants is to guard over their part of the ancient city, and await the awakening of the Dark One. These servants were most likely the strongest leaders in the conquest of the ancient city, and the journal entries only clearly lay out two of them. There's a possibility of four other potential servants, one of which you met before in the Lava Caverns, the others we have yet to see. While this whole plotline is mostly speculative and doesn't have many consequences to the story, it slowly builds upon the lore of the invasion of the ancient city and how organized these monsters within the city now really are. Directly following the sorcerer fight is the true home of the Guardians, or maybe the workshop they were made in, along with the story on the wall depicting the words of the wise sage who invented the Guardians and the despair in his final moments. The whole wall text story details the tragic falling of the ancient city through the invasion and the complete helplessness of its citizens to stop it. For now, what we can glean from this is that these supposed dark folk were sealed away below the city, but eventually the seal was broken. The journal adds more detail to this, stating that the king forbade anyone to approach the seal, and the king's assassination is even more questionable since the higher-ups such as Arx Genian and the wise sage don't even know what happened to their king, much less the citizens. It's a depressing escalation to see the failure of the Guardians to fully defend against the Dark Folk, while some Forest Folk either flee or trap themselves in to prevent the darkness from reaching the surface. Moving further into the Wise Sage's quarters, we see the home of the Guardians, a massive chamber filled with murder hobo rock golems, where we find the Engineer's Key. In order to obtain the key, we have to put multiple binding crowns and watch as they step off into the abyss. I've always wondered what was beyond this corridor, why it was so dark, why were these strange noises coming from the void? Where in the city does it actually lead? There aren't many inaccessible areas in Kingsfield 4, but most of them spark curiosity like this one, even though its only purpose is to transport guardians, most likely to other parts of the city through hidden tunnels. With currently the rest of the city cleared, we can go further north towards an ominous mountain. We finally find another friendly face, and a soldier no less, from the Heladin expedition. It seems he's the only surviving soldier for now. Missing his sword and the leader of the journey. I always thought that there would be a hidden quest to find this guy's sword, but sadly there hasn't been anything found yet.
Moving through the creepy door, we find ourselves in the hub of the Snake Soldiers, Widdas as the game starts to call them, finally at the heart of what killed the expedition, and maybe a branch of the invasion of the city itself. Now if you were an absolute giga chad with 400 herbs, you could simply face tank the scorching hot flames as you casually stroll up through the front door of the fortress, but we're not going to do that today. Instead we have to explore these dingy, damp oceanside caves. I happen to enjoy this area. On my second playthrough I was looking up info on NPCs, but stumbled upon an old walkthrough that had a whole segment complaining about the ocean caves, but I don't see anything wrong with this area. It feels like another Earthfolk area in the way that it's foreign while being close to the ancient city. It also adds nice visual variety as it looks almost completely different from anywhere else in the game once you reach the shore. The lighthouse is a really interesting set piece and adds to this. I also love the endless expanse of ocean and mountains that surround the coast. It took all the way to now for me to bring up the swimming mechanics. Granted, it wasn't really required up until this point. By the time you reach the ocean caves, you only have one or two opportunities to fall into water, and they're relatively hidden, so this might be a player's first experience in the water. To start off, we have an oxygen meter. Once it depletes, we start losing HP, but healing can still counteract drowning. Just like in real life. Try it. Second, you might notice that we plummet to the bottom. Our only choice is walking in water. This makes sense because we're denser than a modern day Ubisoft fan, and if you're wearing historically accurate Crusader armor, I'm sure you would drown in water as well. We also move slower while underwater, which in itself isn't that bad. The only issue is we turn slower as well, which is egregiously slow. The default turning speed in King's Shield is slow enough, but bearable. This just makes it annoying. Even if the system is a bit obtuse, I feel like it's realistic. The slowness of the movement in water might be why some players dislike the ocean caves, but to me, it's not a big deal and I prefer to focus on the aesthetics of the area. There are a couple of secrets within here. Your average homeless man stuck by giant lizards who wants to poison the water supply. The little alcove is probably the hardest for me to find and might be one of the toughest hidden areas to find in general, so I won't spoil it. There's also more remnants of the Heladin expedition on the skirts of the Widow Queen's fortress. Two injured men and one who's really hungry. I sure hope nothing bad happens here. At the end of the shore is a looming ocean fort, a relatively short structure, but littered with glittering gold, trinkets and baubles, paid for in blood. This place is absolutely littered with traps, and I love it. The ocean fort is Kingsfield in an essence, a small but interconnecting area, stuffed with tough enemies and spiteful traps that perfectly exploit the player. You're lulled into a false sense of security, with the first trapped corridor being a simple arrow tunnel, only to find yourself later in an inconspicuous treasure room bamboozled by the ground giving away, dropping you into a completely different segment of the castle. That was just a simple trap door. This fails to mention the treasure room, where the entire floor just dumps you into a pit filled with piranha-infested waters. I love these traps because they're the most effective ones in the game. There are some trap chests that can feel cheap at times, but these prey on the gameplay instincts of the player. Ooh, shiny thing has only ever been punished by a trap chest at this point in the game, so the player is conditioned to gun it for chests. It's assholish, completely unpredictable. It's pure distilled Kingsfield. The whole reason we had to sidetrack away from the fortress was to gather three Widow artifacts to be able to pass through the castle. At this point, if you still want to go the cool way, you have the opportunity to burn yourself alive. But as you equip all three accessories at once, the flames disappear. We also see that the hungry soldier has blocked the door, and the others are gone. Is he eating something? Oh well, Snake Queen time. The Widow Queen's Lair is one of the most eerie stages in the game. It's more unsettling than the monster-infested ancient city because there's a real semblance of order in the enemies, along with truly being isolated from the city, much like in the Earthen Folk area, where the differing architecture makes you feel like a stranger in another land. Here it makes you feel like an intruder. You can tell by the amount of soldiers they've killed that the Widows truly hate humanity, so you already feel very unwelcome at the start. Topped by watchful sentries that drain your magic, an entire tomb trapped to the brim with horrifying giants, the Widow Queen's Lair is one of the most hostile environments you'll traverse in the game. Not to mention the egg mines, just past the fortress. Where the lair feels to be designed with hostility, the mines are definitely designed in order to kill you, with a trapped minecart and railway into the abyss. The music here is also intentionally airy. Some of the ancient city's ambient tracks have an unsettling undertone or can be uncomfortable to some listeners, based on the instruments used or sound effects implemented in the song. 
but The Widow Queen's Lair is much more intentional than these other tracks. All of this unease helps build the tension that should exist when single-handedly besieging a fortress of human slaying snakes. This is especially clear when exploring the trapped tomb. It's in place like any normal wing in the structure, but upon a few steps, you see a malformed giant crashing through solid stone brick. You have the choice to either fight your way through or run. Both are grueling options, as when you run, you'll find more and more monsters breaking their way through the walls, slowly filling up the labyrinth of death. And if you get lost, you need to maneuver expertly around them or pay the toll with blood. But once you find yourself in the exit corridor, past the many similar adjacent tombs, you're not out of the clear just yet. You have to dodge around an arrow trap, but place yourself on the wrong platform and oops, you're back at the beginning again of the labyrinth, in the middle of a dozen groggy and upset bastards that you woke up. This is another trap door that's different from the last two. Even though it's relatively expected, the player has ample opportunity to run to the exit instead of another adjacent wall crevice to dodge the oncoming arrows. But if they were to play it safe and hastily make the decision without suspicion, that's where they find themselves back at the start, making this trap feel far more fair while simultaneously preying on the same player tendencies as before. After the Tomb of Giants, we find ourselves a lanky fellow who despite being against your entire existence, refuses to fight you. Anyways, giant snake tubes that you cheese with a stealth necklace and crossbow, but you thought this boss fight was over. For now, you have to fight not one, but four menacing wizards. Oh, I guess there's also the snake queen. Yeah, anyways. Grab the Master Sword from humanity's only hope, Septiago, and find the same scrunkly man who raved, YOU JUST KILLED THE Widow QUEEN, HOW DARE YOU! And immediately follows it up with, ah, I guess I don't really care. Move on. I love this guy. You know what I don't love? Miners. And what's worse than a miner? Than the slimy, disgusting mine they live in. The egg mines that precede the Widow Queen's fortress is relatively short, but a slightly frustrating area. See these minecarts move at Mach 10, and some hidden items require you to run off the middle of the track. Topple this with a minecart track to hell, and the most maliciously placed minecart in existence that nearly crashed my game. What? What? Uh. What it? Huh? My I think was that my capture card or was that my PS2? There's a huge delay now. What did I do? I did grow to appreciate this area more during my second playthrough, as the bullshittery of the scuffed minecart tracks is basically the same as the traps in the previous section, and they're not too punishing to a player that uses saves or is observant. It's just my personal least favorite area. But in a game like this, where every area is incredibly strong in certain aspects, it's not that bad. I do like the gross, weird vibes it gives off, and the fact that they're literally using this place as storage for eggs. But ironically, instead of the Widdas coming from eggs, we learn that they're just transformed people, and the Widda eggs actually stop the transformation somehow. <laughs> You can see this when we go back to that shack outside of the fortress. The hungry dude has a forked snake tongue, but if we give him an egg, it actually stops his transformation. And at the edge of the mines, we find another man who just wants a nice snake omelette. And after we give him his nice meal, he'll kindly open up the way to the royal graveyard, which in itself is relatively short and unnoteworthy, other than it's another graveyard and houses one of the best area in the games. A serene, sunken city, adjacent but separate to the ancient city, the music cuts out as you enter the area, leaving you with a light lake ambience, letting you take in the lonely and mystic atmosphere of the area. It's here we learn that there used to be another civilization in these lands, that the Dark Folk, and no, not the same Dark Folk that invaded the ancient city, these original Dark Folk would live amongst the power of darkness in its raw form, embracing it as a way of life crafting an idol to house it as a place of worship. But eventually the darkness grew out of control and willed to destroy everything. So they sealed the idol and themselves away. You could feel the desolation and hopelessness in this area. We know that the dark folk weren't inherently evil and in the end had to sacrifice their entire kingdom to contain spreading evil, much like the fate of the ancient city. There is nothing left for them to do. There is much more to this city, much deeper than it leads on to be, that we can peer off into but never explore, making it feel more like lost history and a tragic climax to this thriving city. 
So now we have a whole cohesive timeline of Kingsfield 4. That's starting from centuries back, all the way to the time of the Dark Folk, and creation of the idol, to the founding of the ancient city by the king of the Forest Folk. We now know what was unsealed by the king's son, the original altar housing the idol and its pent-up destructive energy, and the ensuing aftermath. We can assume the monster came from the idol, since the original Dark Folk had been long dead by this time, but we have much more to learn later. For now, we finally reached the base of the ancient city, the entire journey leading up to this moment. It's amazing being able to look up and see the progress we've made so far. Entering the center tower is a decadent fountain that heals both HP and mana, a true mark of progress. Unlike the previous levels, there are only two main directions left to go, but this is the most exciting stretch of the game. One main path leads towards a poisonous cesspit filled with regenerating slimes similar to the forest golems, which we could technically run past and probably sequence break the game, but that's ill-advised. There's also a sign that mentions the Mansion of the Howling Winds and Serac Resmach, two things to keep a note for later. Instead, we make our way into the King's Treasury, where we can commit some serious crimes, maybe sample his spoils a little bit. We find Shad in the most badass position possible, in the middle of a room filled with spear traps. Truly, he's living up to his name. He mentions that he looted a lot of the treasury, but didn't find what Zestari was looking for. Curious, we'll have to look out for that. We find Zestari's keys in the same room, which will let us open the Forest Folk chest that we ran across five hours ago. Great! Zestari has been a legendary thief briefly mentioned throughout the game could seemingly break through any lock. Being an inspiration to thieves, he tried to test out his luck in the ancient city. We later found his bones on the second floor, clutching at Zestari's map. Or perhaps he lies dead here within the spear room, as there's a curious pile of bones where we find Zestari's keys. Regardless, the ancient city claims yet another legend. It's cool to see the ancient city implement these minor NPCs and ancient legends visually throughout the game. Within the treasury are skating demons, lots of barely useful money, just that lowered your brightness, and a fun lava hallway we can glide across. Whee! Normally you'd have to disable the lava trap through a hidden wall, but fuck that, we're living life to the hottest. Inside is simultaneously the best, but ultimately unnecessary item in the game, and most likely the treasures the star was after, the king's map. A fully fledged 3D map of every area. Now you may be asking, what makes this unnecessary? Mostly the fact that Kingsfield conditions the player to memorize dungeon layouts and rely on their own sense of direction 99% of the time. And exploring new areas doesn't require any sort of map whatsoever. While there have been maps, they've been mostly realistic, immersive maps that are pretty shitty images that only help you get a vague idea where you are. This throws all that out of the window. Don't get me wrong, I love the King's map just cause it lets the player get a glimpse of the whole scale of the map, but at this point in the game, it really doesn't do much for an experienced player. Aside from that, there's some more trap chests, and a funky fresh push you to your death wall trap that preys upon unaware players. A unique trap accompanied by a further broom that incorporates light riddle solving in order to obtain the King's Ring, I mean Ring of Wisdom, an item that'll help us later. There's even more to this section of the ancient city. We find an assortment of rooms above the treasury and inevitably venture to the fabled Mansion of the Howling Winds. This area is shrouded in mystique and comes out strong with a beautiful theme. We learn more about Serac, whose doors have been popping up around the first floor of the ancient city. Serac is presumably an engineer and scholar who studied the old Dark Folk, as we see curious five-eyed skulls in his quarters. We also get to talk with the last remnants of Serac's soul, where he created a form of guardian for the forest folk known as the Genians, the slimes we found in the basin. After fully exploring the depths of the mansion, being filled with a similar poison, we eliminate the entire National Reserve of Shreks and find another dark servant that watches over this segment of the ancient city, one possibly tasked with ruining the Genians to allow the rest of the invasion to occur. While this creature is probably responsible for the corruption to the Genians, it may have also been Serac's arrogance of creating life from nothing. Regardless of the cause though, Serac was wrought with guilt and turned himself into stone. But upon defeating the demon, we obtain Serac's key and an icon of purification. Zarek's key being a vital piece to a puzzle that's been building throughout this entire journey, the events of which can finally be set in motion now that the path's been cleared. Remember the black eyes we've obtained that were all from a segment of the Holy Forest requiring the use of four keys from four important factions of the ancient city for them all to come together? No? 
Okay, well, now that we have them all, we can truly uncover the treasures hidden deep within the king's castle, inside the throne room. We can utilize our Ring of Wisdom to access the prison of an ancient accursed king, the one whose powerful rule eventually evolved into fear and his exilement. A story told by the forest priest right near the beginning of the game. Killing him is unrelated to the Black Eye Orbs, but shows how there are even more secrets within this castle that we never realized. The real reward requires us to traverse the Passage of Light, a proving grounds for warriors riddled with pitfalls, electric traps, golems, but worst of all, the music. Yes, not all of Kingsfield music can be a winner. The Passage of Light surely is... something. By far the most comically bad theme I've ever heard in a game. It tries so hard to be intense, and to be fair, when you stumble into this area at level 10 and get inflicted with every debuff under the sun and smited by God, it is a little scary. But at this point in the game, the music is very overdramatic and hilarious. But after traversing that maze, the king's room awaits, and we see the king's bones just lying on the floor, his soul remaining to tell us. When I saw the darkness within my dearest one, all hope turned to despair. Please help the fragile forest children who have been consumed by the darkness. From this we can imply that the king was not in fact assassinated after the return of the prince. There would have been no feasible way for an assassin to get inside this room, especially the greatest defense of all, terrible music, coupled with the fact that even the high-ranking officers of the city didn't know where the king went during these events, it's more likely that the king locked himself away in despair, and either withered away, or committed walking two steps after starting the game. It's tragic, but better than that the fate of the earthen folk. Turning around, we finally see the last piece of the puzzle, a peculiar sealed door with four round notches near the bottom. Upon placing the orbs, ominous steps lead to an overgrown mystic shrine, being directly copied and pasted from Ninja Blade, the greatest game of all time, being a prequel to Elden Ring and Miyazaki's Birth of the Sun. A centerpiece basking in the sunlight from the surface of the Holy Forest. Then we remember the stories from the Elf Priestess, that of the old Kings of Blade, once wielded by Septiago, with its luminance drained. We place it on the pedestal, and... This may not come as a surprise to longtime FromSoft fans, but obtaining the Moonlight Sword of Legend is a very grandiose moment that deserves its own segment. Like I said, the entire game has been leading up to this moment. From the second you reach the Holy Forest, two to four hours in, and throughout your entire journey you've been collecting pieces of this puzzle to obtain the Bane of Darkness, something powerful enough to dispel the darkest depths of evil. Now, in your hands. With the Holy Moonlight Blade, we can collect pieces of Lord Mew's armor, the defender of the forest folk in legend himself, the last line against the dark folk who tragically fell within the old battlefield that leads to our final confrontation. Upon cleansing the corrupted basin, we can venture past it to this battlefield, housing a prison, a dead dragon of all things, and the Palace of Darkness itself, the original resting place of the idol. Within the prison is the Dark Knight, the last servant who slain Lord Mew, and is by far the strongest enemy we've faced, potentially leading the charge in the Dark Folk invasion. It is here in this battlefield where the prince broke the seal into the palace, and set all of these events in motion, who became corrupted by the darkness, an open way for an invasion. The engineers and craftsmen of the city scrambled to create a choking point of defense with the genius, placed guardians around the city, both failed. Lord Mew had fallen, and the forest folk fled in disarray. Those that did not flee were killed, or trapped, or worse, maybe turned into the dark folk themselves. But now, all of that is history. We need to make one last step into the cathedral. Using the Moonlight Sword to light the way, the Dark Succubus guards the entrance, but it's no match for the power we've accumulated throughout the journey. Inside, the Altar of Darkness lies in wait, to be contained, and the struggle is finally over.
That's right, we still have to end this for good and kill God. Within the idol holds the power of the Dark One. With him still alive, the cycle would only repeat itself. Inside the idol is the most grotesque and creepy stretch of the game. Not only do all the cells and tapeworms regenerate constantly, they hit you as hard as the final twist does. Venturing through these slimy chambers, we come across a cesspit of acid and rot. Dragons emerge to halt our progression. Crystalline golems stand in our path. More constantly regenerating enemies meant to drain our resources. Atop the mountain of filth, we see the true fate of the Forest Prince. You seek the dark too, he rasps, molded into his throne of infestation. The two in his line tells us that he was once in our position, presented before the previous Dark One, seeking his own power in life. This is why we never see his remains or hear of his fate. He vanished after returning to enact the Dark Folk invasion. The King mentioned he sensed darkness within his dearest one, and if the player somehow manages to get here without the Moonlight Sword, killing the Dark One leads to an epilogue stating, The darkness found a replacement and fell into sleep again. So while this is my personal lore theory as to the events of Kingsfield, as much of this has been speculation, a lot of it is rooted in plausibility through in-game dialogue and other details present within the game. I've tried to make an interesting, cohesive narrative to accompany us through our expedition through the ancient city. I find this vague and hidden lore of Kingsfield 4 to be one of its most interesting aspects, and it's taken a lot of scrounging for information and old sources to complete this theory, making the game feel much more impactful to me personally. Regardless of your theory, this climax is amazing thematically, but mechanically you can just run past all the enemies, which I actually recommend this time, and all you have to do is hit the Dark One three times. Each time he pushes you off so you have to keep running circles around the area as well. Normally I'd say this is an underwhelming boss fight, but everything leading up to this moment has been spectacular, and it's still satisfying to finally put this reign of darkness down. Upon cleansing the Dark One with a Moonlight Sword, he turns to stone and crumbles away. The darkness that looms over the Holy Land has dispersed and the neighboring kingdoms and the ancient city itself can finally feel peace. And that is Kingsfield 4. Definitely one of my favorite games, judging by how much I've spent rambling about it. The atmosphere is exquisite, and the whole game was truly underappreciated in its time. Thankfully, more people are going to discover this gem and Kingsfield as a whole, with popular Souls creators like Iron Pineapple giving more light to them. I think the reason I love this game so much is it's so aesthetically solid, be it the music, graphics, mechanics, that claustrophobic and oppressive feeling that looms over most of your journey, satisfying exploration that makes you feel like you're excavating the long lost history of a fallen civilization, everything plays into itself to support a fun and interesting gameplay experience that's not to mention the interconnectivity of everything. You start off the game at a small scale, and the world quickly starts to open up with a very cohesive map and lots of connecting characters and plot points, everything ramps up in intensity the further you delve into the ancient city, including the power of your character and the seriousness of the plot. With how weak you start at the beginning with a simple wooden club to having ancient legendary swords that smite gods at your disposal, this game does a great job at making you actually feel powerful by the end of it, without it being too easy. Thank you very much for watching the in-depth look into Kingsfield 4. It took me an incredibly long time to write out my feelings about this game, and even then it is a jumbled mess. This script alone has been haunting me, as I've t it's taken me weeks to adequately describe the experience, and even then it's probably bloated with unnecessary things that are just a result from a long creation time. I had to take on a new format that I've never done of sequential order. Yeah, other people have done this, but I never personally liked it until it felt right with Kingsfield 4 and I hope that I transcribed the gameplay experience well enough so you could feel a little bit of what it's like to actually play, which was the goal of this whole format. That's enough of my postscript rambling. I wanted to delve further into FromSoft games after my history video on it, since I know I didn't do justice to many of the games. I can't promise I'll be able to cover every FromSoft game, since some I might not even be interested enough to make a video on, but I will eventually go through all of Kingsfield, even if it takes me years. I'm sorry this took many months for me to make, you can tell by how long it is. I had a lot of creative troubles, despite how much I loved the game. But I hope you enjoyed the history of- oh, uh, wait, that's the wrong video.